Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. I um, I rarely feel pride, but I do feel proud that, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say, but one of the probably five most august, esteemed, prestigious, selective universities in the world has just invited me to, um, to give a talk on uh, career and life uh, issues for their uh, faculty, students, grad, you know, I, I don't want to be so specific, but anyway, um, it's amazing. I'm, I'm, I really am happy. And so the very first thing I did was I, I made a list of, they asked me for a topic. They wanted a title for the talk. And um, I made a list of what I thought were my most potent ideas that would be relevant to them. And, and it turns out relevant to you, to most people. <clears throat> and I'm calling it 15 Ideas for a Good Career in Life. And I want to just, uh, I thought I would kill two birds with one stone. I would do a run-through for my talk there and um, uh, as well do a, a podcast. So this is going to be a podcast. So, okay, the first one is what I call the traffic light rule. And I mention it first because if over the years, if there's anything that people have told me they remember and found useful, it was a traffic light rule. Think about the fact, have you not run into somebody who's long-winded? and you wish they would shut up because you want to say something or you just feel like you're not being valued. Well, they may be saying that about you, maybe. So, especially in job interviews, but in general, in all kinds of interaction, it's a good idea to follow the traffic light rule. And it's not a rule, it's a rule of thumb. Rules can be broken at times, of course. But especially if you're worried about being too long-winded, you might want to follow the traffic light rule. And that is this. During the first 30 seconds of an utterance, your light is green. During the second 30 seconds, it's yellow. They're perhaps, in, the chances are increasing that they wish you'll shut up. They want something to say or they'll forget what they were thinking. And then at the 60 second mark, your light is red. Yes, there's a very occasional time you want to run a red light, but usually you want to stop and either stop or ask a question so that a conversation is more like a ping pong game than a set of lectures. Now, of course, I recognize the, the uh, hypocrisy in that here. Uh, this particular format requires me to lecture you for, I'm guessing, 30 minutes or something like that, so I apologize for the hypocrisy. Um, there's a very, there's a corollary to this rule, which I call the 40-60 rule. In a two-person conversation, the rule of thumb is you want to talk a little less than half the time, say 40%, let the other person talk 60, so that they feel invested, you have more opportunity to learn, you're not thinking of you as a blowhard or self-absorbed. So I like the 40-60 rule. And again, it's just a rough estimate. The third of my 15 ideas for a good career in life is that only some people should network. The standard advice is that everybody should network. It's the key to career success and etc. I have found that that is way an overgeneralization. There are some people who are naturally good at it. They're quick on the draw verbally, they have, they're good looking, and so they immediately attract attention. I hate that, but it's true. Um, and there are others you know, whose track record suggests it doesn't work. They put themselves out there, struggle to put themselves out there, and it doesn't really help. So in terms of you, think about your track record in networking. Has it been fun? Has it been helpful? To the extent to which it has, great, do more of it, whether it be one-on-one -on -one or in groups or in parties, whatever. But if your track record sucks, rather than doing more of that, focus on doing the kind of reach-outs to people that are more compatible with who you are. If you're looking for a job, just do a really good job of answering that job ad. If you're a good public speaker but not a good schmoozer, give more talks at professional conferences, local meetups, churches, whatever. Um, the other thing to consider is fun. Is it, will, you know, will you, what, what will you find fun? Uh, some people find it fun to write articles, blog posts, make videos. That's a way of reaching out that may be more compatible with what works for you or what word, would work for you. And finally, in the work world, somebody who's just crappy at all that networking is wise to climb on some heavy hitter's coattails, be their assistant, volunteer to work on their project, flatter them and say you'd heard great things about him or her, you'd love to work for them. So that, sec that third idea uh, that is to share is that not everybody should network. You need to find your way of reaching out, if at all. There are some people who just really don't like reaching out at all, and some of the most brilliant scientists and writers and whatever are relative hermits. So only some people should network. Number four, 
if you're looking for a job so often people are so eager to be impressive in the interviews that they're not judging the other person they are judging the 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 employment opportunity the job interviews need to be thought of as like first dates you're both checking each other out and that's also going to make you more relaxed you're going to be less tense less sucking up nobody sucking up doesn't actually impress usually so it's important to read their body language think about how careful they are in responding to your your inquiries do they do they take too long to respond do they put you through five rounds of interviews that sounds like it's a very inefficient organization you don't want to work there and then in the interview you don't want to just ask, answer questions and really judge the quality of the questions they're asking you then when it comes time at the right moment you you ask questions not just at the end where they'll always say do you have any questions but even in the middle you know saying something like at the right opera right time you know every boss is a little different how do you picture uh, being my su being is how do you picture supervising me and shut up and listen okay then when you offer the job if it's an in-person job something you can at least visit in person and there's people in the workplace go visit the workplace what's the vibe is it relaxed but people are working hard or the people are is there are their desks too neat are they chatting too much or they seem frustrated unhappy frenetic hang out in the break room a little bit and when you see a friendly looking person say you know i've just been offered a job here and i just wanted to get a sense of what it's like you might ask a question like what should I know about working here that wouldn't appear in the employee handbook? You may or may not get a great answer, but it's certainly worth asking. Okay, so that's number four, how to vet an employee, employer. Um, number five, negotiation. It really helps, and it's not always possible to get, to have walkaway power. If you only have one job offer in hand or, or up and coming, you're going to feel desperate and you're going to be inclined to take it. So especially if you know you've got a job offer coming or any kind of negotiation see about finding a competitor who will you leverage your um the fact that you have a job offer by calling some other prospect say hey i've just you know i'm, I'm going to be offered this job i wonder if you're still interested in me if you can even get the possibility of a, another offer you're going to feel more confident and you can be able to walk away if they lowball you another part of preparation is really important is to get comparables it may not be so easy, but there certainly are websites like like Glassdoor and Salary.com, uh, Payscale.com, where you may be able to get at least uh, geographically adjusted salary figures for your particular uh, level of experience in the job title. But you may, if possible, you know, obviously it's great if you can get more localized information, which may or not be possible. So if you do know somebody, yeah, it's good to ask about compensation. You may or not may or may not get an answer. But that kind of preparation can be very helpful. Um, make clear what your musts and wants are how important is that extra 10 grand in salary it's you know at the usually your top to extra 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 thousand dollars is going to be taxed at your top rate and in coastal cities that's going to be more than half so you're only going to keep less than half of what you negotiate the employer though has to pay it all and then there may be raised expectations that if you don't meet you could be on the chopping block if you're too expensive then it's easier to make you the next person that gets laid off um folks so therefore the corollary of that is to focus on non-cash benefits things that benefit the company and benefit you and that aren't taxable maybe an increased contribution to 401k you know retirement plan maybe it's going to be uh, you want to work at home more or work at home less that could be negotiable especially if you couch it in terms of this will be good for me and good for the employer so i'll be fresher or whatever you won't have to waste office space if it's your title title can make a big difference in your future employment later on is it who you report to if you heard about this really great manager or maybe in the interview process where there are usually three four five people interviewing you and there's one person who really impresses you you might in the negotiation say, I wonder if it's possible to work informally, dotted line, or even directly report to person X. Those are the kind of things that go training budgets can be very often negotiable. You know, if you get a training budget and you can get to perhaps go for that training in Hawaii or that expensive software that you can work on at home, those are great things. So focus on, uh, it's, you know, uh, on non-cash. Don't put too much weight on stock options, by the way. Stock options you know we all see billion to million dollar exits in our in our eyes but too often stocks end up being, if it's a startup end up being worth nothing and even if it's an established company your your stock that they're giving you is 
at a given price. If the stock goes down, you're not going to get, you're going you're gonna to lose a lot. So don't put too much weight on stock options. And of course, that whenever you cash those in, those are taxable, which again, you're going to lose more than half in most coastal cities. Okay, that's five. Number six, hiring. I only, I only want to say one thing about hiring, because if you're in a position to hire, there's nothing more important than hiring the right person. It's the most important thing that managers, leaders ever do. And the one thing I want to stress is that interviews are so bullshittable. The only thing that is not bullshittable are simulations. So in a job ad that you're placing, create a problem set or a problem or a, uh, that, that the person will be a difficult task that the person will often have to do on the job. But in the, in the top line, say, a parallel exam will be, off, will be given for finalist candidates in person or under proctored conditions. That way they can't, can't hire a ringer to do the online version. Do simulations, value those more than references, where you, all kinds of bullshit reasons people can get good references when they're terrible, and more than interviews, which is very often a function of how well coached somebody is or how glib they are, which may or may not have, usually doesn't have that much to do with what the job is like, and yet people are so biased toward what they personally experience. Don't overweigh interviews. Number seven, time. Everybody complains about time management. And the, the things I want to say about time are getting clear about what matters to you. What are the projects that really matter? What are the discretionary? We tend to do what's fun, but sometimes what fun isn't what necessarily matters the most. And most importantly, and what that I've seen is, how, and at this university I'm going to be talking about, these are really hard workers. And they feel guilty. They've been guilt-tripped into wanting to have work-life balance. But these are some of the smartest PhDs and faculty, you know, PhDs in the world, um, if their life is out of balance and they choose it to be out of balance, they shouldn't be guilt-tripped and called workaholics. They should be called heroic because these people especially have a great chance to make a big difference in the world. But even if you're a, a, a bricklayer, if you're a damn good bricklayer and you have a choice between spending hours 40 to 50 playing Monopoly or watching video games or doing a great job of laying this beautiful brick patio or whatever it is, it is not, uh, you, it doesn't make you a workaholic to work hours 40 to 50 laying the brick. Decide what really matters. Number eight, calendaring. I have a client who uses five different calendaring systems. Crazy. So it may be helpful to share with you my system. I have, if uh, I'm always working from home. I have uh, my, my home office, I have Zoom clients, phone clients, uh, and some in, a few in-person clients. Uh, and I write a lot and make these videos. So um, I'm here a lot. And so I don't use Google Calendar or my iPhone calendar. I simply use a, this is my schedule today, um, my, <coughs> my client appointments in a, <coughs> that are, t you know, anything that's time delimited, I put on my week at a glance pencil and paper calendar. It's faster, never runs out of battery life than an online one. And <laughs> for my to-dos that are not time-delimited, I simply have a memo cube, and I write them down, and I keep updating it and changing it all the time. And I keep that front and center in my desk. So between those two things, and I check them all the time throughout the day so that I don't miss a timed appointment, and I am doing the activities that I, I prioritize. I think that is an excellent calendaring system. Of course, there's nothing wrong with you using a, a digital calendar if, that, if you're peripatetic, if you're out a lot. <coughs> so, um, but for me, who works in my home office all the time, uh, the week at a glance paper calendar works fine. Um, number nine, procrastination. It's usually career cancer. It's terrible, but it may not be bad. Sometimes you're procrastinating because you realize it's not a good use of your time. So don't immediately beat yourself up for procrastinating. But if you do need to, to get stuff done, one of the key, keys to avoiding procrastination... <laughs> is to avoid excess perfectionism, especially in the first draft. I remember reading an article in, uh, in Fast Company magazine in which uh, the leading lights of Silicon Valley were interviewed and asked for what are the secrets to their success and productivity. And one of the commonalities was they operate out of the philosophy of ready, fire, aim. Not ready, aim, fire. Ready, fire, aim. So a modest amount of preparation. Try something and then aim. That is then revise your way into excellence. And that is true of most work and it's less painful. You get more done and it's less painful. When I write a blog post or an article or whatever, 
I will write a crappy first draft without getting my ass up out of the chair, usually in an hour, something like that, and then I walk away and then I start revising. And be the time I publish it, like on medium.com or, or read something to you, and this is not read, of course, this is all I'm ad-libbing I'm doing with you now. Um, it, I have gone over it 6, 8, 10, 12 times. But it's not, none of those revisions are painful because I'm just kind of going through it and fixing what seems obvious. So I encourage you to use ready, fire, aim as your approach to most tasks. The other procrastination tip I want to offer is the one second task. Very often we're overwhelmed with the enormity of some task. It looks like a huge mountain. But just as they tell you the key to climbing a mountain is to put one foot in front of the other, the same is true of most tasks. Start. I'm about to have to start to do my taxes. I hate doing my taxes, um, but I have to do it. And so the way I do most onerous tasks, I start with the one second task. What is the first thing I need to do? What's the first easy thing I need to do? It might be to sort certain papers on my schedule, sort my income, my 1099 forms or whatever. Do ask yourself, if you're stuck, start with a one second task. Then when you've done that one second task, one more one second task. An object in motion tends to stay in motion, so get started. And a one-second task is a nice, friendly way to get started. Number 10, keep your life simple in every possible way. Excess materialism complicates your life and doesn't in usually result in increased happiness. Food, I, I've, I'm not going to bore with a great deal of details, but I have figure out simple ways to eat healthy and tasty. So in the winter, I'll just talk about breakfast. In the winter, it tends to be oatmeal with, uh, with a handful of... Uh, uh, some walnuts and a little shredded coconut and, and cranberries. Takes me two minutes. Love it. Um, when the weather is uh, warmer, I tend to have non-fat yogurt with a piece of fresh fruit in it, whether it be a banana or peaches or whatever. Takes no time. Healthy, filling, uh, period. Uh, keep my life simple. Keep it simple to shop, simple to cook. Uh, I do that for most meals and snacks, like my go-to snack is, is little baby peeled carrots with uh, salsa. No time, no effort, healthy. Um, okay, another way of keeping my life simple, investments. I didn't do this in the beginning. I wasn't, I wasn't knowledgeable enough. I grew up in dire poverty. I had to learn on my own skin, unfortunately. I did not like brokers at all. They ruined me. But so now all I simply do is I invest in a Vanguard, one or two Vanguard ETFs. One of my, my very favorites is VWO. It's an it's a index fund of all the emerging countries in Asia. And the other is simply Vanguard Growth Index Fund, which is the largest companies weighted by their how much they're growing. Very low fees. Vanguard is great. You get diversification. I love it. Uh, other people who are a little more risk averse might try a Vanguard all-in-one fund or a BlackRock, what they call, I think, call they call it life path funds. S simple, low-cost way put you all your money except for your emergency fund, which you can keep in a checking account or money market fund or whatever. There, that simplicity keeps me from monitor and monitoring the the prices or whatever. And whenever I have, a, a, frankly, an extra 500 bucks, that next day I go and I invest it in more Vanguard. And that's called dollar cost averaging. And that way you, you end up making more money because you're buying more shares when prices are low and fewer shares when prices are high. Dollar cost averaging. And it also, therefore, is not stressful. Um, okay. Um, I also keep my life simple by curating people. I have very few friends. I have a few that I really like and I've really kind of politely... Um, backed off on uh, on other people, including family members, as well as clients. There are some clients, who have prospective clients, who I just don't think, let's just say, aren't a good fit, and I just turn them down. And they're a very, very occasional client, career counseling client, who after a session or three, I say, you know, we're not right for each other, and I also cut that off. Curate, 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 curate. We all curate what we buy, but also curating people is another way to keep my life simple. Number 11, relationship report card. I have been with my wife 50 years, 46 years of official marriage, and I think that uh, it's very important um, to vet any serious relationship using what I call the relationship report card. For A to F, your partner has to score at least a B on each of these. Sexual compatibility. It doesn't mean that they have a high sex drive or a low sex drive. If they have roughly the same sex drive as you, especially as the relationship goes on. There are some people after three months are not very interested anymore. Others are still very hot to trot. It doesn't matter. The point is that you and your partner have compatible sex drives. Two, 
uh, the second part of the relationship report card that everybody's got to be both partners have to get at least a B is communication. Do do you communicate reasonably well? Not perfect. There's always going to be arguments. There's always going to be miscommunications. But generally, do you communicate well? Do you num- number three? Do you respect each other? That's really foundational, and it's probably the key to my respect to, to my my mar- marriage working. My wife is bright. She's ethical. She's pretty. She takes care of herself. Uh, she doesn't have any fatal flaws. You know, she's not a chronic depressive. She's not an alcoholic. She's not a spendaholic. She's a reasonable human being, and that engenders a lot of respect. And while there, we, you know, there's always disagreements. That's, but that's got to be at least a B on uh, on your relationship report card. This is a, a more squishy one. That each party has to put themselves, the other party, on a pedestal. Though it's a hard world out there, and the judgments tend to be very ruthless. The, your your partner you have to, your partner has to put you on a pedestal think will kind of give let you slide because she loves you or he loves you very much uh, and vice versa uh, and the final thing is just this ineffable thing called love it's, those things that I mentioned before are relatively rational factors but there is this feeling I tell you the truth whenever I walk into the when my when the phone rings and it's my wife I have a good feeling it's 50 years later when I walk into the house and I see her I have a good feeling that's this ineffable thing I call that's what I call love so I encourage you to cause to any important relationship use the relationship report card to vet it and then if it does if the person doesn't score at least a B on all that it's probably wise to suffer the pain of ending the relationship and finding somebody better or being solo. I th- believe that solohood is an underappreciated option. We still, even though the rate of marriage is declining, I think solohood is an underappreciated option, especially with the increased enmity between the sexes. I, some of the happiest people I know are live alone, only occasionally date if at all, maybe have platonic friends, have a dog, have a very busy work life or avocational life, recreational life. Don't dismiss solohood just because the norm is still couplehood. Number 13. Uh, reducing stress. Um, I am a stress-oriented person by nature. I'm very fast-paced. I'm, I always tend to rush. I, it's, I, I don't like it, but it's who I am. It's in my DNA. But what helps me are what are called micro-breaks. I don't believe in long vacations because it takes me forever to get ready for the vacation which and cram all my clients in right before I leave, and then I have to cram them all in when I come back. And then there's the hassle of travel, with the traffic and the TSA and the flight delays and COVID and getting ripped off and getting lost. And uh, ugh, I don't like travel. No matter how beautiful the Acropolis might be, I don't, you know, it's not worth it for me. So I like micro breaks. I will, as soon as I start to feel antsy, I will play with the dog, dog right down there, sleeping next to my bed, next to my desk. Um, I will play the piano for a couple of minutes. I will clean the toilets. I will go make lunch. I will take a walk uh, with the dog, almost always. Um, you know, micro breaks are very refreshing. Even one deep breath, even getting up and stretching, st- turning your neck around. Micro breaks, lots of them, are a great way to reduce your stress. Um, and finally, uh, this is something that I've said so m- I've told the story so many times, including to you on YouTube. But it is what I planned. To- I've ended almost every speech that I've ever given uh, with this story um, because it's a good story and it's a true story and it has an important message. And so, even though you've, if you've watched my other YouTube videos, you may have heard this before. I'm going to do it again. I'll do the short version for you. My father was a Holocaust survivor. He and 39 men dug, it, uh, dug out of a, the horrible pit. He was forced to burn the Jews that the Nazis shot. This was before the gas chambers. But he and 39 men used their spoons that they had for their, for their gruel, and they dug a tunnel, and they escaped under the barbed wire from the pit where they were burying these, these, uh, these Jews that they had to burn. And they escaped and lived in the Black Forest. In any case, he had the ultimate Holocaust tortures. It was the worst. And yet, and he was dumped on a cargo boat at the end of the war, dropped in the Bronx, no money, no English, no nothing. And he worked in a factory sewing shirts in Harlem, and he saved up enough money to open up the only store he could afford, a crappy little store. Went to night school, learned English. He didn't didn't fool around. And then he, he never complained. And one day I had to be his security guard because the store was very dangerous and they all the store was so small you had to store most of the merchandise outside on folding tables. And on the weekend the kids would come and steal whole boxes of shirts and sunglasses and whatever. 
But anyway, um, it was one day, business was slow, my dad is outside. And uh, I say, Daddy, I'm 13 or so at the time, I say, Daddy, how come you so rarely talk about the Holocaust? And he stiffened, which is something he rarely did. And he said, Martin, the Nazis took five years from my life. I won't give them one minute more. He said, Martin, never look back. Always take the next step forward. And I have had the privilege of being career and personal coach to some of the most successful people on planet Earth, as well as some real strugglers. And one of the differentiators beyond intelligence and drive is that successful ones have failed, but they're far more likely. And they've, they've had failure. They've been had very bad experiences with spouses, with, with crime, with whatever, with bad parents. But the successful ones are far more likely to follow my, uh, father, follow my father's advice. Stop looking back always take the next step forward. And that's what I plan to say in a nutshell. Let's see, that was 25 minutes, of, in more like 45 minutes uh, at this wonderful university that I'm so flattered that they've asked me to come. Um, in any event, as usual, I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. And I like to end all these podcasts with my very favorite slogan that I do believe is more important today in our censorious times and groupthink times than ever. We find comfort among those who agree with us. We find growth among those who don't. I'm Marty Nemco.